So this month, we're taking a look at the three shortest books in the Bible. Third John wins as the shortest book when measured by the number of words in the original written language of Koine Greek. It is only 219 words long, and it is an actual letter written for a specific occasion addressed to a single person. Now, there are many letters in the Bible, and Paul wrote a bulk of them, That's, uh, but most of his letters are to churches, entire communities of people. That's what we find in Romans and Corinthians and Ephesians. But the letter of 3 John is addressed to an individual, Gaius, who is beloved and presumably the leader of a congregation. The author simply refers to themselves as the elder. And while 4th century Christians believe the author to be John, the son of Zebedee, who was also thought to be the author of the Gospel of John, we really can't know for sure who it was. Robert Kaiser, who wrote the commentary for 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in the New Interpreter Study Bible, says this. This tiny letter offers little in the way of theological significance, but it illustrates the kinds of problems that arise in congregations of any era. Okay, trying to write a sermon on a book of the Bible that, quote, offers little in the way of theological significance can be a bit of a challenge. But I would disagree with Dr. Kaiser because dealing with the problems that arise in a congregation is theologically significant. It is part of what seminaries call practical theology, the ins and outs of being a community of faith that wants to love God and neighbor. What could be more significant than that? The elder in 3rd John is primarily concerned with the church's partnerships and who they're, who they're supporting. Diotrephes is a no. He puts himself first and does not welcome friends or authority. Sounds like the early church knew that narcissists need not apply. We could probably use more of that kind of discernment still today. Demetrius, however, is a yes. He's been vetted by some others and is to be trusted. Third John is written to ensure that Gaius and the church support and work with the right kind of people, the friends. He writes, therefore, we ought to support such people so that we may become co-workers with the truth. I loved that in this statement is the assumption that there will be co-workers, people with whom we work together to do the will of God. The church was never supposed to do it alone or do it all. Instead, we are called to build partnerships and develop relationships with those near and far to share the love of God with the world. The church should have co-workers. Now, there are churches in this country and around the world who really do try to do it all and all on their own. They're often called mega churches, and they have created elaborate campuses with gyms and bowling alleys and coffee shops and schools so that everything a churchgoer might need can be found right there on that church campus. I can see the draw of that in some ways. All your education and fellowship happens in the same place with the same people who share the same beliefs as you. And I guess there is some comfort in that, and I don't know, safety? But there's also something very insular and limited about that kind of community. We already know that social media keeps us in these echo chambers that reinforce what we are already inclined to believe and think. So if we add to that a very homogenous and inward-looking church community, when will we be challenged or encouraged to use our critical thinking? Where can we go to hear different perspectives and understandings on life, faith, and religion? Mega churches can seem cool and definitely seem successful by traditional standards, but I would easily prefer a church that doesn't have all the bells and whistles, 
but encourages critical thinking, embraces diversity, has partnerships in the community, and plays well with others. One of the reasons I first felt called to Calvary was because of your propensity towards partnerships. You all had recently received a very generous bequest, and you could have decided to build your own thing with Calvary's name on it, something flashy and new that would serve the city in shiny ways. But instead of asking what new thing can we do on our own, you all asked, who's already doing this work in the city? And how can we best support them by partnering, partnering with them, both financially and with the resources of visibility and volunteers? When I heard about the Breaking Cycles of Poverty Partners, now called our Matthew 25 Partners, I was encouraged because it signaled to me your humility in knowing that the church is not always equipped to be a social service agency. Nor do we have to reinvent the wheel. There are already amazing agencies and nonprofits doing important and good work, and we can partner with them, support them, be co workers alongside them rather than trying to become them. I love that you chose New Door Ventures, SF Achievers, Raphael House, and the Boys and Girls Club. I love that we've reassessed these relationships and chose to add the Hope Center supporting women at Safe House. Now that's not to say we won't ever be inspired to do something new and shiny when we are called, but it is to say that we have been intentional about seeking out partners in ministry who share similar goals and ethos to bring about the kind of world we believe God intended for humankind. Sometimes those partners share our faith, Sometimes they don't. In fact, some of the most rich partnerships we have participated in are interfaith. Those of you who have participated in the San Francisco Interfaith Council know what I'm talking about. We learn and grow from our siblings from different faith traditions, and we serve and walk alongside them, literally walking together at Pride, working together at the Interfaith Winter Shelter, learning together in Bible study and pulpit sharing. Our partners, who may or may not be Christians, make us better followers of Jesus nonetheless. Rachel Held Evans writes, One of the most destructive mistakes we Christians make is to prioritize shared beliefs over shared relationship, which is deeply ironic considering we worship a God who would rather die than lose relationship with us. They will know we are Christians, not by who we exclude, not by who we condemn, not by who we hate, but by our love. Now, the elder in 3 John was concerned about relationships, relationships among church members, relationships with other leaders, his enduring relationship with the congregation. And while he had a hand in Gaius's faith and in the life of the church, he also knew that he had to pass on some of that work to others, like Demetrius. What the elder began, he knew he could not finish. And sometimes that is one of the hardest parts of ministry, partnering with good people on good work that you know you cannot bring to complete fruition. I know that when I left the church I served in Minnesota, I was prepared to say goodbye to the congregation, which was hard enough. But saying goodbye to our partners in Colombia who were based in Barranquilla and Cartagena, with whom I had visited multiple times and gotten to know, hadn't really even occurred to me, and that was just as hard. Similarly, I know those of you who work and volunteer with youth also often feel like that. We get to witness these young people grow up in the church, but we don't always get to see who they become as they graduate and get older. There's a wistfulness in having to let go and trying to trust those who will come after us, but with ministry, partnership is necessary. 
And what's complicated about partnerships is that, one, you're not always in control, and two, you have to know when to pass the baton, which is hard, especially when we know that we could do it best, right? I imagine that's how some of these early church starters felt as they wrote to their former congregations and church leaders whom they had worked with and had come to love. Perhaps if the Romero prayer had been written back then, they could have taken solace in that. This prayer, which I will share with you, was composed by the late Bishop Ken Utner of Saginaw. And the words of the prayer are commonly attributed to Oscar Romero, but they were never spoken by him. They were a tribute to him. Listen to this prayer. It helps now and then to step back and take the long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is another way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water the seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces effects far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something and to do it well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future not our own. So, who are your partners in ministry? Who is working with you in the effort that God has called you to do? Maybe it's members of a group here at Calvary, Faith in Action, Deacons, the Racial Equity Initiative. Maybe it's some of our partners at Safe House or SF Achievers. Maybe it's your kid's PTA or your neighborhood's home association or your colleagues at work. Take a moment. Give God thanks for coworkers, our partners in ministry. Maybe write them a letter this week in gratitude. And if you can't name any, consider who might you partner with so that you're not going it alone because we weren't meant to do this by ourselves. And now take a, t a step back and take in the long view. Know that ultimately God is in control and we only have a small part to play, our part, and it's enough. We do not have to be the Savior. In our tradition, Jesus is already the Messiah, not us. We cannot do everything. Let there be a sense of liberation in realizing that. And may we trust God enough to do the rest. Thanks be to God. Amen.